Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have Jessica Ware. Uh, She's an assistant curator in in invertebrate zoology at the American Museum of Natural History. And she seems to focus on dragonflies. So, Jessica, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Yeah, tell me, um, why do you do what you do and why dragonflies? What got you interested in them? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I mean, the reason why I do what I do is I've always been really interested in the natural world and in natural history. Um, And I kind of got interested in entomology when I was in university. But when I was in graduate school, I really kind of learned more about systematics and about evolution. Uh, And in particular, what I study is insect evolution. Um, And once I learned how old insects were and that they were the first things to fly and that they've been around, you know, predating birds and bats and pterosaurs and the things that I was more familiar with, it kind of hooked me. Um, and so I've just consistently, uh, I guess, focused my, my, my life's work on, on these, these insects. Um, and then of the insects, there's a lot of different kinds and dragonflies um, are just maybe the most interesting, uh, you know, they're beautiful and they're good flyers and they're, one of the first things that branched in the insect tree of life. So they're the earliest flying insects or something like dragonflies were the earliest flying insects. And I think that's pretty neat. Yeah. How long have dragonflies been around? I guess I, I, did, I assume in my mind, I'm picturing them flying around with dinosaurs moving around you know, near them. They, how long have they been around? Yeah, they were definitely around far, way before dinosaurs were. So the fossil record seems to suggest, you know, 250 million years or so. Um, and our genetic genomic um, analyses seem to suggest around the same time. We have examples of things that are not modern dragonflies, but that looked a lot like dragonflies that flew in the Carboniferous period 350 million years ago. And some of our work on the insect tree of life suggests that maybe the first flying insects were around 400 million years ago. So long time. Yeah. Well, what is it about them that you're studying? Uh, you know, how they interact with the ecology or what do they contribute or what do you what are you studying? Well, I've been pretty interested in studying how they're related just for the point of understanding how these different uh, species are related to each other. Um, but then we use we reconstruct these things called phylogenies, which are kind of like family trees, only um, they're describing basically relationships among, you know, thousands and thousands of insects. And then we use those phylogenies to test, like what you're saying, for ecology, to kind of test the evolution of particular things that relate to their place in the ecosystem. And so for dragonflies and damselflies, I've been really interested in understanding the way that they lay their eggs. Um, There's different strategies for egg laying and the way that they interact with predators like birds and frogs and and fish. And then they do long distance migration. So they, they are like some dragonflies are actually like humans in terms of their spread. They're kind of transoceanic migrants. And so I've been really interested in studying the mechanisms, I guess, of migration and just 
better understanding how uh, these really vagile, you know, these really, they're really capable of flying long distances, how they respond to climate change and, and temperature variation. Oh, so what, I mean, what's interesting about them or what's unique that you've discovered? What, what role or hidden role do they appear to play? Well, dragonflies are really, I guess, top predators in most of the systems uh, that they inhabit. So as nymphs, they develop in fresh water. So females lay their eggs in fresh water. And the nymphs basically are like lions, right? So they're swimming through the water, eating mosquitoes, controlling fly populations, actually. It's thanks to them in part that we don't have as many mosquitoes. Um, and then when they emerge as adults, they also are voracious predators. So they're also lions, uh, kind of of the sky. But what, what do you mean? What do they what do they eat? Like other bugs? What do they prey on? Yeah, they eat other insects. They eat each other, but they eat other insects. And they well, it's not that they're specifically eating flies or targeting flies because they'll also eat butterflies and, you know, really anything that's in the sky. But they, they do a very good job of controlling um, mosquitoes and, and kind of reducing the number of flies, uh, both in the juvenile stage and the adult stage. So although sometimes people want to see, you know, what's the value of an insect? And it can be hard to say what the value is of an insect to a human. I always always say for dragonflies, that is one thing that that's one service that they do. Um, they consume these things that are pests to us and that actually have, you know, pretty severe human health consequences because many mosquitoes can vector, you know, dengue or yellow fever or malaria. How do they, um, how do they eat flies or how do they eat mosquitoes? This is like some serious aerial combat, it sounds like. Oh, it's amazing what they do. So you might, well, actually very much like a lion, they do what's called interception style predation. So if a dragonfly sees a fly flying, it won't fly to where the fly is, right? It will, it will do a little bit of math and it will calculate where the fly is going to be in 10 seconds or so. And it will fly to that location and intercept the fly as it's going on its journey. Um, and that interception style flight is pretty remarkable. So many other insects don't actually do that. They, they would actually just go to the location where the prey currently is rather than, you know, intercepting the prey as it's going along its path. Um, so it's pretty remarkable. And then they have, you know, pretty um, substantial jaws, which are called mandibles, and they basically crush their food items. So <laughs> they're able to, I mean, they can consume another insect in a really short period of time. They're, they're good eaters. How do they descend upon them? Is it from above or do they come at them sideways and they curl forward? to, you know, so they can like essentially like collide with the, the bug and grab it? That's a good question. And I think it does vary a little bit from situation to situation, from location to location, and from species to species. They, I've often seen them flying and swooping down onto things because some, some species tend to fly very high in the air column and when they kind of swoop down. But I've also seen them take off from a perch and fly upwards towards a prey item. Often, if you've ever been out in the summer and you see dragonflies kind of flying over your lawn or over an open field, um, kind of flying backwards and forwards, what they're doing is aerial hunting. So they call that hawking. So that behavior is called, and they basically just fly backwards and forwards, shoveling food into their mouths. They have spines on their, their legs, their tibia, and they can just eat as they fly, just shovel food in. But then when they see something in particular, they can swoop downwards or upwards to catch it. What are, what are they most similar to? It's, I just get the feeling they're kind of like hawks or owls and how they hunt. Like, have you been able to use cameras to watch them close up and slow it down and see them eating? Yeah, well, people, I mean, I we don't actually use a lot of video work in, in my lab, but there are people who have done that, who have really looked at kind of the aerodynamics of flight uh, with respect to their hunting and their feeding. And so I think it's pretty well worked out. I mean, dragonflies in general, um, their wings have been studied a lot for flight because People want to try and understand how they can fly 30 miles an hour, <laughs> how they can fly 11,000 kilometers in one, you know, swoop, uh, because we could use that for bio-inspired, uh, bio-inspiration, you know, so we could better perfect our flight styles. So I think that flight behavior and dragonflies and wings, et cetera, is, is pretty well, well studied, although there's still a lot we don't know, um, but, but it's, it's, a, it's a good field. There's a lot of people working on it. But, you know, again, so you've seen, have you seen a, like a slowed down time lapse of the, you know, of the dragonfly approaching and grabbing prey? Yes. Yeah, that's been done a few times. And I've seen, I've seen many of these videos and it's pretty remarkable. So each species is slightly different, but basically they tend to have their, their legs are out. They kind of use their legs to grasp their prey as they're coming up on it. 
Um, and then they, they use their legs kind of as a basket holding the food item as their jaws consume it. Do they, um, I would think that their mating is similar. Do they like mate in the air and have this, like, this courtship when they're flying or what do they mate? Or how? Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. Well, it varies actually from species to species as well. So most dragon, so that's, that's something that's very cool about dragonflies and damselflies is that they have two, males have two penises. So they have a penis at the tip of their abdomen and a penis at the base of their abdomen. Um, and that's an evolutionary adaptation that's pretty interesting. And so males actually take the sperm from their primary penis and put it into their secondary penis. And then males will approach a female <laughs> and they grasp her behind her neck. Um, and if she is receptive, then she will bring her abdomen up to the secondary penis for the sperm to be transferred. So long story short, they be- kind of make this heart shape <laughs> as they're attached to each other. And then they take off. So some of them just stay perched in that heart shape for some period of time. Others immediately start flying. The ones that are flying together as they're mating, sometimes just the male is flapping its wings. Sometimes the male and the female are flapping their wings. They're usually pretty clumsy when they're flying together. Um, so it's actually pretty risky because they're vulnerable to, to being eaten at that time. And then when they uh, are finished with the sperm transfer, then they fly to the water because females need to lay their eggs in the water. But some males will stay attached to her. Like they do not let go <laughs> until she has laid those eggs to try and ensure fraternity. Because there's other males kind of constantly coming up trying to grab these females. So females um, get kind of still, the, the male still grasps the female behind the back of her neck and will grab, carry her right to the water to lay her eggs. Other males don't. Other males let go of her and just kind of fly around her, um, chasing away other males that come to try and mate with her. And then the last kind of male are what's called non-contact guarding. And then those, in that case, the males, as soon as the males and females disconnect from each other, then the male just kind of, he bounces and she lays her eggs solo. When, um, when a dragonfly is, is tracking prey, can you tell by observing it? Do you see like its eyes move or... You know, as you're an outside observer, you have no clue that it's tracking or what it's tracking. It can be, sometimes you can notice that they're looking at things because they do, they, they can move their head in a pretty spectacular fashion. They have on the back, they're, they're really visual predators. So much of a dragonfly's head is just its eyes, right? If you look at a dragonfly's head, almost all of it is eyes. And their eyes, behind the back of their eyes, there are these little hooks, almost like a Velcro, attached to their neck. And their neck is almost like a little peg. So it's like a semicircle sitting on top of a little peg. And so that when they're flying and they don't want their head to fall off because their head's only attached by this Velcro, the Velcro is kind of engaged, right? So the Velcro on the back of the neck and the Velcro on the back of the eyes hold the, the head in place. But when they land and they're, or when they're looking for, for food, they Velcro unclasps the, the head arrestor system is what it's called, but it's like a Velcro. It unclasps and then they can move their head. They can rotate it basically in all directions. Um, which is neat. So you can actually look to see that they're, they're moving their, their head left and right in a pretty extreme fashion. That also makes it very hard to catch them, <laughs> I would say. But when they're flying, it can be really hard to tell because they keep their heads, the Velcro kind of, what's the word for engaging a Velcro? It's Velcroed. <laughs> they keep their head and their neck kind of Velcroed together while they're flying. So then it can be harder to know whether they're looking in one particular direction or another. Oh, so in order to scope things out, they, if they're actively flying, they can't look around as much and they have to well, they, kind of be hovering to do it? Yeah, they often will just turn. They have, they have pretty good turning, what's called turning radius. Um, so they have small turning radii in some species. So they can actually just kind of, sw- sw- that's often when you see them flying over meadows or whatever, they're kind of swerving to the left and to the right because they're, they're actually flying around and that allows them to see, you know, the breadth of their the field uh, that they're flying over or whatever the case might be. How far away can they see and target effectively? 
Oh, that's a good question. I actually don't know how far away they can see, like what the farthest distance a dragonfly can see is. I'm not sure. But you like routinely will take things, you know, 10, 15, 20 feet away from them. But I don't know what the what the maximum distance they can see is. I'm not sure. Has anyone tried to put decoys, you know, flying around like particles in the air or other things that maybe would trick them into thinking it's spray? If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Yeah, actually, that's one of the ways that people collect dragonflies. So in Japan, there's this device uh, that has been around for, well, a very long time, if not centuries. And it basically is, it almost looks like two weights at the end of a very small string. And when you throw it up in the air, dragonflies fly towards it thinking it's a fly. But then the weights that are attached to the either end of the string weigh the dragonfly down and it makes it come down to the ground and then you can just pick it up. Oh, it grabs the, um, it grabs it and doesn't let go and so you can pick it off? Yeah, well, it grabs it and doesn't let go. And then because it's heavy, because it has weights on it, it quickly, like with gravity, kind of brings the dragonfly down to the ground and then you can just pick it up. And oh, we've made so some, I mean, yeah, they they have some ones that are, are pretty uh, neat, but I've just made really basic ones, you know, with just weights on either side of a very small string and throw them up and it really does work. They they come pretty quickly to it. How good is their, um, is their targeting? Is it like amazingly precise or do they miss quite a bit? Well, I think that they are actually fairly precise, but I also think that they take a lot of risks. So they, I mean, they're doing these trade-off calculations, I guess, for energy expenditure. Like, how much energy do you want to risk to go and try for something? Um, Just as most predators do. But I've seen dragonflies um, take a lot of risks (laughs) and and miss things. I've seen them miss things many, many times. Uh, So I think that they, they must have a low threshold for what they're willing to try for. So even though they miss a lot, it might be because they're they're not being very picky what they what they attempt. Well, have you ever observed them in different conditions, you know, like different seasons or with different prey? And do they adjust their risk tolerance or different environmental conditions or different prey? Oh, yeah, that definitely is true because they are, you know, not warm blooded animals. Right. So they really rely on the heat of the sun uh, for their energy uh, to warm up, you know, for their flight muscles to be warm enough so that they can actually fly. So they would take far fewer risks, you know, at dawn or at dusk when it's darker and colder. They're definitely less likely to, to fly out and use up those resources for sure. Yeah, very interesting. What What have you learned from observing them? What do you think, I don't know, has like the military ever called you and said, hey, we want to use their targeting system for us to target, you know, like surface to air missiles or is there anything we can learn from them and incorporate in the human world or just in general? Yeah, I think that people, I mean, there are people who specialize specifically in, you know, bio-inspiration, looking at insects to try and use them to design better tools for humans. And so my friend uh, who's at a professor at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, her name is Mariana Allen. She's been looking, I, I sent her a bunch of dragonfly wings because she's been looking at the surface of dragonfly wings, which are kind of antimicrobial and anti-wetting. Uh, because that would there's a lot of things that we don't want to have wet. And that would be really great if you could use that for bio-inspired design. The head arrestor system that I was talking about, the Velcro-like structures behind the eye and the, and the neck, Stas Gorb, who's a professor in University of Kiel in Germany, he was using that to actually improve Velcro. And certainly when it comes to, to flight, um, you know, there are people who have been specifically looking at dragonflies just from the aerodynamic perspective of flight. Um, and how better to to approach, you know, hunting and tracking. I know that for sure the Navy uh, was at one point very interested in trying to figure out how you could use dragonflies to control malaria. Um, I don't know that anyone's ever been successful in releasing enough dragonflies that would maintain a population that you could actually consistently control Anopheles or Aedes aegypti. But in there have been studies that have been published that show that they do significantly reduce those mosquitoes. So I think the military would have a lot of uses to, you know, uh, for dragonflies and for, for the things that they do. Yeah. I was thinking they'd, they'd have like operation dragonfly and that, <laughs> that, you know, based on that. Yeah. yeah that'd be great. I don't know. What other, I guess, curious facts about dragonflies have you learned? Like how long do they live? Do they do any other unusual or amazing things that would be interesting to people? Well, I mean, dragonflies, don't live that long as adults what's neat about dragonflies is that they're much like i mean there's a few other insects that do this including cicadas for example which are out right now but they 
have these juvenile stages that are really long. So some dragonflies develop in, as nymphs in freshwater in a short period of time, like a month or two, but others take like upwards of five years uh, to develop. And then they emerge as an adult and they only have two months basically to do all the jobs, you know, to eat, to mate, to disperse, to lay their eggs, which is kind of remarkable. So in Canada, like I'm from Canada um, and in parts of Canada, it's, you know, the, the lakes and waters are frozen solid. Um, and studies have shown that, you know, some nymphs like in northern Saskatchewan, they can actually, these they can be frozen solid in blocks of ice. And then when the ice is thawed, the larvae, the nymphs are just kind of crawling around just fine. And we've sampled a lot in the Arctic because there's a particular dragonfly that's found in the Arctic called Somatochloris albergi. And we sampled it. I sampled it in Fennoscandia, Finland, Norway, Sweden. Uh, and my graduate student sampled in, in the Yukon. And what we noticed is that, you know, they're in permafrost bottomed lakes. Uh, that get very, very cold. Um, and they have these really long development times, you know, over five years, we think. Um, so it's just remarkable that they're able to have these really long lives. We think of insects as being short lived. But I mean, I know people who have kids who are five years old who think they're pretty old. <laughs> so why don't you think of insects that way? Um, it's kind of remarkable. And I just love that they exist in these in such extremes. You know, some exist in the hottest parts of the rainforest. And others exist in frozen and blocks of ice in the Arctic. Like it's a, there are dragonflies in the desert. You know, there's, they just really have exploited basically all of the biomes. You can really find them almost everywhere. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Except um, so for salt what, water. They can't, like, they oh, don't like salt water. Oh, do they? Well, I would think they would go around marshes. Do they go Not, pretty near brackish water? There's no, there's like only a, a few that can tolerate brackish water. We have one in New Jersey, which is where I live now that can tolerate brackish water or with Diplex Bernice, but most of them are actually very sensitive to salt. And some of them are actually very sensitive to pollutants in general. Some are not. There's a huge variability in their tolerance, which is why they, they some of them can make quite good candidates for biological evaluations of water. You know, you can use them and look at what species are present and it will tell you whether or not um, the watershed has clean water or whether it's polluted just based on mm. who's living there. Oh, that's smart. Okay. So what uh, what new experimentation are you thinking about doing with them? Like what, what hypotheses are you working on right now? So we just got this big National Science Foundation grant. Um, and it's a multi-institution grant. Um, and basically for this grant, we're going to, we use genomics, which is where you sequence, you know, a large part of the genome. And we're going to do that for, there's 6,300 or so species of Odinate. Odinata is the order to which dragonflies and damselflies belong. So dragonflies and damselflies, there's around 6,300 species of them. And so we're going to try and sequence as many of them as we can, as close to 6,300 as we can, at least 4,000. And then we're going to get all of the morphological data that we can about them and their geographic distributional data, ecological and life history traits data. And our goal is really to have a full, complete story of the evolutionary history of this group. And in doing so, I think it will really help us better understand how insects in general, but certainly fast flying insects like dragonflies and damselflies, how they are responding to climate change, how the geographic ranges have, have changed over time, if they have changed over time. And then having these, this big amount of genomic data will help us better understand the evolution of color, the evolution of vision and how they perceive color, and the evolution of dispersal and, and migration. A dragonfly is uh, heavy enough where you could put some kind of tagging system on them to follow them around and see where they go? Some of them are. And people have done it before. Mike May famously did this in the early 2000s or maybe 2006 or something. I forget what year it was. But they used a mixture of eyelash glue and crazy glue and they glued radio transmitters to a dragonfly called Annex Junius, which is a really uh, it's a relatively big dragonfly. Um, and they fly, they're migratory and they were able to follow it in a helicopter because they had to be close enough. Or maybe it was a, pl a small plane, small single propeller plane. They have to be close enough that they could pick up the radio transmitter. I've, I've known other people. There was a group in France that also did this. And one of the graduate students said that a majority of their radio transmitters, they recovered inside the bellies of frogs, which kind of tells you that these dragonflies are not flying to their optimal capabilities <laughs> with these radio transmitters glued to them. So the biggest a limitation i suppose to that resource you know that tool is just that they're, at this point they're still too heavy for the common dragonfly to not fly unimpeded right so if they're just going to end up in predator's mouth you're not really going to be able to you know use this tool to really establish their flight patterns or what have you which is a shame but hopefully they'll keep getting smaller and smaller you know these rfid tags some of them are, can get pretty small 
Um, but then, of course, you need to have, you know, trans- things that pick up the signal in the locations where you need to be, which is also a limiting step. It'll be really cool if machine vision gets good enough where you can identi- like do like a, not a gate analysis, but the equivalent, you know, of how, a, you know, Bob the dragonfly flies and then you can follow him around because, you know, yeah. like his, his flight is a little bit different from everyone else. Yeah, that would be really neat. I mean, they're good at what. Once you can get video of them, which is which can be challenging, but they you can use these kind of tracking softwares to kind of model the movement of individuals. And so there's a particular dragonfly that I'm super interested in that we've been working on for about five or ten years now, I guess, uh, called Neurocordulia, the shadow dragons. And I was initially interested in, in its genetics, and so I had done a bunch of genetic work. But then I found a population of them. They fly at night, too dark to read a newspaper, often like over the middle of water, uh, which is hard, makes it hard to catch them, uh, middle of open water. Uh, but I happened to find a population at my Nana's house in Northern Ontario, of all places, at a location where they're easy to sample. So I spent the last four or five summers, not last summer because of COVID, but the last four or five summers just sitting and observing them. Um, and that's exactly what I want to figure out is the individual, like individual Bob, how he is flying compared to other shadow dragons because they have very erratic styles of flight that I think is evasive maneuvers for nighttime predators. So we've been trying to figure out ways that we can film them so that we can track individuals under low light conditions because they're called shadow dragons for a reason because they fly at night. Yeah, I wonder, uh, I don't know, I guess I I wonder if fireflies interact with them, but you know, I guess it's it's a very specialized type of thought. Yeah, I mean, they would eat anything. They're, They're not picky. Yeah, and like you said, certain things eat them. We know that frogs eat them. They love them, I guess. They're delicious. So. Yeah, but they also eat. They get it. They give as good as they get, I guess. So when they're nymphs, they actually will eat tadpoles, and they'll eat small fish. So they can take vertebrates when they're nymphs. And ex- people have done experiments where they kept dragonflies in water and then removed them and then put tadpoles in the water that there was no longer a dragonfly in, but they still had the chemical cues, the signature of a dragonfly having been there. And the tadpoles actually changed their behavior to not move <laughs> for fear of the predator being there. So I think they're, you know, pretty impressive predators when it comes to things like hyla or other, you know, frogs that are in, in freshwater. What have you learned from looking at the, <laughs> the genes of the dragonflies and their sequences? Anything special there? Well, what's interesting is that there's a lot of rate variation. So, we, you know, genes, each gene kind of evolves at its own rate. But what we're finding, which is not a surprise, what we're finding is that there's a lot of among lineage rate variation. So different species have very different rates of evolution. And it doesn't seem to follow necessarily a pattern that we can figure out yet. So we thought, we wondered whether maybe there was latitudinal gradients for rate variation, because we often see dragonflies and damselflies have these really long generation times developing four or five years in fresh water before emerging. We often find those at really high latitudes closer to the Arctic. And so we wondered whether maybe there was a latitudinal gradient that was related to this evolutionary rate because you accumulate mutations over time. And if you have really long generation times, you're just going to accumulate mutations slower. Um, but we don't, we didn't see that. So it's, it's interesting. I mean, we're, we're finding that there's a lot of heterogeneity, a lot of variation, and we're trying to figure out what some of the drivers are of this variation. Not all dragonfly groups are the same. So some dragonfly groups are really speciose or species rich where there'll be a particular group of dragonflies. One that's really common that people probably have seen is called the skimmer dragonflies. If you've ever gone fishing or boating or canoeing, you've probably seen them flying around you. Well, there's, you know, close to 1,500, 1,700 species of that particular group. But there are other dragonflies that have 10 species. And why there's some groups that are really species poor that have very few species and others that have so many probably has to do with some adaptation or some, you know, something happened in their evolutionary history that allowed them to kind of rapidly speciate or it doesn't have to be rapid, but allowed them to speciate so greatly. But what those drivers are, that's what we can use the genome to try and understand. Yeah, very interesting. Um, what, are, what are the biggest, fattest, you know, dragonflies on Earth? Maybe they could have transmitters put on them, especially because technology keeps advancing and, and miniaturizing. Like, what are they and where are they? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Well, so the biggest one um, that's like in terms of wingspan, I guess, is Megaloprepus. And it's found in from Mexico down to Peru. It's a damselfly. They have really wide wingspans, but they're very, very thin, slender, and they'd be too light. They're, they're not very heavy. They're just very wide. 
they have really big wingspans and they're actually spider predators. So females and males will kind of hover in front of spider webs and pick the spiders off of their spider webs, these big orb weaving spiders. They actually specialize on those, but they would be too light, I think, to hold a radio transmitter. But there is a radio transmitter. There is a dragonfly that would be heavy enough for a radio transmitter that lives in Australia. And it's called Petalura. Um, and Petalurity is a family that doesn't have very many species. It's one of the ones that are kind of species poor, that family. But the adults are kind of like the size of a sparrow. I mean, they're, they're pretty heavy as far as dragonflies go. And they're, they have a big wingspan too. They're just not as big of a wingspan as, as Megaloprapus, as that damselfly. But they're, they're pretty big. And I bet you they could hold a, a radio transmitter probably. Um, People have tried to estimate ranges using other methods, um, but I don't know that they've ever, well, maybe, I guess I don't know that they've ever done radio transmitting, a successful radio transmitter study for pedalarids, because I think when they've tried to do it, it hasn't always, it hasn't always worked. They're rare and they're they're actually considered to be threatened or endangered in a big part of their range. Uh, Do dragonflies ever bother people, like bite them or, or are they harmless? They, I mean, they're completely harmless. They don't bite people. Uh, the only thing I've ever heard kind of negative that anyone's ever said about them is that sometimes females that are, that if you're standing still fly fishing or something like that in a river um, and not moving for very long, sometimes females will land on you thinking that you're a stalk or a reed, emergent vegetation <laughs> that, you, that they're trying to lay their eggs into. Um, and so sometimes that startles people to have them land on you. But they don't bite. They don't sting. They don't. They don't hurt you in any way. I've had them bite me a couple of times, but only because I was holding them and trying to put them into an envelope to collect them. And it doesn't actually hurt. It's actually adorable when they do it because they have these mandibles and jaws, and it's very cute, uh, but not painful. <laughs> you know, it reminds me when my kids were really little. We went to like a butterfly park, and you know, my son. I think he was like a year and a half and you know him and some of the other little kids that the butterflies would land on them and they would scream in terror and you know nothing's going to happen to them but it was kind of funny and <laughs> then there was a room with parrots and i noticed that some of the kids like they were afraid of the butterflies but not of the parrots and some of them were afraid of the parrots but not the butterflies so the dragonfly just reminded me of that yeah that's interesting i think some people you know who there's a, a colleague of mine vanessa lebeau and she studies how what what makes kids afraid of things like insects and arachnids and she seemed, her work seems to suggest that it's kind of learned behavior. They're picking up on cues from their parents. So I wonder if it's that your your son's friend's uh, parents, you know, some of them like butterflies more. Some of them like, you know, maybe they're kind of imparting that uh, on their, their kids in a yeah, subtle way. Yeah. Like, because kids observe everything. Uh, and if you're, you know, swatting away things or you seem nervous by them, then they're going to be nervous of them too. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah, when yeah. I've seen dragonflies... I don't know, from my memory, I always see them like hovering above the water and I didn't know if they could you know, hurt me or not. So it, they just seem, I don't know, they seem like you want to swat them away and get rid of them. They seem like they're going to hurt you, but I'm glad I asked you that they're harmless. That's good to know. Yeah, they're completely harmless. And in fact, you know, if you look at a dragon, some people, in, our, in a lot of cultures, seeing a dragonfly or having one land on you is considered to be quite good luck. <laughs> so you could try and just tell yourself it's good luck that you're seeing them and that they're, they're landing on you. That's cool. Oh, last question. Do they do they appear near like stagnant bodies of water? Are they attracted to bodies of water, some species, or uh, just large bodies of water, let's say? It's a mixture. So some of them specialize in what's called low tick or flowing water, like rivers or streams, and others kind of specialize on still water, Atlantic water, stagnant water, lakes, ponds, marshes. It really depends on the species. And then there are others that are kind of cosmopolitan. Like there's this one dragonfly that I study that migrates really long distances. And it will, I mean, if there's like a puddle, it will, it will stop there and lay its eggs in because it's kind of adapted to take advantage of, you know, rainwater that pools up after heavy rains. So even temporary or ephemeral water, it will lay its eggs in. So there's a real mixture. So there are some that are kind of what they call classic river species and some that are kind of classic lake species. And each, each one is neat, I would, I would argue. Oh, very cool. So what's the best way for people to find out more about your work? Where can they go? Well, they could either find more information about me at the American Museum of Natural History's website, or you could find my Twitter handle, uh, which is Jessica L. Ware Lab, J-E-S-S-I-C-A-L-W-A-R-E-L-A-B, Jessica Ware, L. Ware Lab. There's a singer named Jessica Ware, so I have to put the L and the lab on there. Otherwise, you'll get a lot of soulful ballads from um, a British uh, songstress instead, if you if you Google that. 
You should uh, contact her and tell her to, to write a song with the word Dragonfly in it or the name yeah. Dragonfly. <laughs> yeah, really, we have our mentions completely entwined then. That's true, yeah, yeah. Well, very cool. Jessica, thank you for coming on. It's been a super interesting call. Thanks so much for having me. Nice to talk to you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.